Hello kitties, it's terrible triple feature time once again. Unfortunately, Black Awesomeness is over as February is finished and now it is March. Uh, fortunately, this is the time of McDonald Shamrock Shake, which I look forward to every year. And for some inexplicable reason, it's going to be Val Kilmer month. I have no idea why. I've it's uh, Val Kilmer's birthday is in December, but for some reason I have an overabundance of ideas for Val Kilmer triple features. So this is where we're at. Starting the month off right with uh, the uh, genre films of Val Kilmer. Our menu includes Willow, Batman Forever, and Red Planet. Now, Willow, I'm sure you all know, is a sword and sorcery epic from uh, the 1980s, starring Warwick Davis as the titular Willow, a uh, dwarf amateur magician, roguish scoundrel Val Kilmer, essentially playing the Han Solo role of the film. Yeah, I say Han Solo. Uh, Willow was by and large created by George Lucas, even though it was directed by Ron Howard, so a lot of the similar tropes, including casting. Warwick Davis uh, met George Lucas on the set of Return of the Jedi, where he played uh, lead Ewok Wicket. And I'm pretty sure he played Wicket in all the subsequent incarnations and had quite a few different roles in um, episode one. But we're talking about Val Kilmer playing Mad Mardigan. This is one of Val's better performances, where he's just, you know, Charming, fun, completely in shape, as it was still the 80s. And it was kind of an impressive uh, role choice for him. Uh, under his belt, he'd already had a Real Genius, Top Secret, and Top Gun. So it's not like he wasn't popular and was, you know, just taking things to take things. He, you know, seemed to really want to make this movie and, you know, have fun, which he clearly did. Val Kilmer doesn't always have fun on the sets of his films, as uh, you'll, we'll find out as the month goes on. Usually he's just, you know, something of a pain in the ass, is uh, the phrase people have used, but not so here. Uh, and why should he be? He's uh, running around, awesome hair, awesome outfit, and uh, this is one of the earlier films, if not the first one he did with Joanne Whaley, who he would later go on to marry. So, all around, good time for uh, Val Kilmer on the set of uh, Willow. Good on Val Kilmer, but he went for it because it looked interesting and would present a challenge. No less daunting would, would be uh, filling in the shoes of a role previously done very well by an actor, but let alone a role in which you wear about 90 pounds of rubber. I'm talking about Batman Forever. The first Batman without Michael Keaton, after Tim Burton and Michael Keaton and Jack Nicholson, uh, made Batman into the biggest thing ever. Uh, Joel Schumacher was being brought on board by Warner Brothers because, well, Batman Returns made a lot of money. Apparently it was supposed to make all the money. And because they didn't, Warner Brothers thought Tim Burton shouldn't direct it anymore and should just produce, which he did. They thought Joel Schumacher was the guy to bring in the big, big money. Great job, Warner Brothers. So Joel Schumacher wanted to bring it, turn it into, you know, a bit of a lighter, campier movie. As a result uh, of the tonal change and probably more to do with Warner Brothers not kicking in 15 million dollars. Michael Keaton said, you know what? I had my fun. I'm gonna go over here, do other things. So without Michael Keaton there was a mad dash to figure out who is man enough to don the bat suit. And they kind of looked at everybody back in the day. I mean, uh, among the list of people were Daniel Day-Lewis, Kurt Russell, Alec Baldwin, Ethan Hawke, Ray Fiennes, Tom Hanks, Johnny Depp, and Christian Bale was not considered for Batman. He was too young. He was actually considered for Robin. And uh, I think we're all kind of happy that he didn't get Robin or else he would have been, you know, cast. 
Well, he just never would have been Batman later, and that would have been a shame. So, uh, Val Kilmer took, uh, signed up to be Batman, not having read the script. Uh, I wonder if that would have, you know, reading the script would have uh, influenced him that way. That's my cat, Lucius, making an appearance. He's been on here before, and apparently he loves Batman. Of the uh, pre-Christian Bale Batmans, Michael Keaton's my favorite, but Val is a fairly close second. Uh, not the least of which because Val does present a bit more of a physically imposing person inside the bat suit. This is, you know, immediately negated by the presence of nipples. Great job, Joel. Joel picked him because of what he saw in Tombstone, and I mean, can you blame him? Val Kilmer is pretty boss in Tombstone, and uh, generally everybody kind of liked Val on the set. Ironically, the uh, the majority of the strife came from Jim Carrey and Tommy Lee Jones just kind of fighting each other, or just getting sick of each other very quickly, which is just... It's just a peculiar scenario all around. And then finally, when it came to uh, the aesthetic and or look for the Riddler, Mark Hamill, uh, who played the trickster on TV's The Flash, uh, said that Joel Schumacher was heavily influenced by uh, watching an episode called uh, The Trial of the Trickster. I don't know, you tell me. Any similarities there? And uh, this brings us finally uh, to Red Planet. Uh, Val had done, you know, the past and the fantasy swords with Willow. He had done the present superheroes epic. And now, I mean, the only thing left for him was to not only put him in the future, but to put him into space. So Red Planet uh, came out, I think, pretty sure the same year as Mission to Mars. It was one of those, you know, we're making two of the same movie, you decide which was better. Uh, tagging along with the intrepid scientists is the space janitor, I'm sorry, engineer, uh, Val Kilmer. You have to look at him as the, uh, the Red Planet equivalent of Yafet Koto and Harry Dean Stanton in Alien. Uh, oddly enough, for a sci-fi movie set in space, every single thing goes wrong. And uh, Val is left to fend with himself and a few, you know, lily-livered scientists uh, against uh, the elements and, of, as per any sci-fi space movie, a homicidal robot that has, you know, targeted them for termination. Yeah, the movie's all over the place. Um, it is kind of fun. This, uh, whereas Willow was more of a, you know, choice and or decision to take a challenge, uh, Red Planet feels like the beginning of the end for Val Kilmer. Uh, it's unfortunate that he's uh, been relegated to directed video land, but uh, this is definitely one of, you know, the bumps on the otherwise downward trajectory. He's really fun in it. Don't get me wrong, I really like him in it. This was, he was full-on Val Kilmer in this movie, and as such had an incredible uh, ongoing feud with one of the other cast crew members, this time Tom Sizemore. Rumors are that they, uh, by the end of it, they weren't even shooting their scenes together. They were, you know, it was like doubles, and it would be a double and looking over the shoulder. Uh, apparently, this grew out of Tom Sizemore getting some sort of exercise machine and Val being jealous of it. <laughs> you know, really important shit. And, uh, but the movie was pretty, uh, I thought the movie was pretty good. It's definitely watchable. It's worth, uh, you know, wasting an afternoon on. Um, but there you have it. Val Kilmer in three distinct ridiculous genres. Uh, Sci-fi space, uh, pulpy superhero, camp, spectacular, God, I hate you, Joel Schumacher, and Sword and Sorcery with Warwick Davis and George Lucas and little Ronnie Howard. Uh, tune in next week where we'll continue with more Val Kilmer for whatever explicable reason I feel like doing a bunch of Val Kilmer triple features. Uh, see you later.